Hello everybody. Today we're going to do multiple regression and we're going to add in a dummy variable and an interaction variable into our investigation. So once again, we're going to play around with a file we used prior called the moving file. In this moving file, you see the following data points, 36 data points, four variables, hours it takes to move, cubic feet moved by the company, number of large boxes moved, and whether the place they moved the boxes, moved the apartment or building, moved the stuff, is the way I'm looking at it, had an elevator or not. So what we have here is a classic qualitative variable. It's not a number, right? Elevator is yes or no. Kind of like having a pool, yes or no. Um, there are many, kind of like, do you live in the east side of the neighborhood or the west side of the neighborhood? There are many, many variables we would like to dummy, um, called the dummy variable being a zero or one, a one being yes and a zero being no. So the great thing about our studio, it automatically dummies for you. If you'd like to dummy and put it into your CSV file, you may do so. Obviously, you just got to understand what the zero and one represent when you organize that data. So in this case, we're just going to go right to our command and create a linear model. What we'd like to do here is we would like to predict, so we're going to use a linear model, we'd like to predict hours needed to move all that material using all the variables you see up there, feet, large, and elevator. In fact, yeah, that works for me. So we're using all three variables in our linear model. Of course, after I've loaded in my linear model, I like to run the summary. And I like to investigate everything that I see here. First of all, you notice you have the coefficients on your prediction equation right there. Let me bring up my Word file just so I have some information I can give to you. First of all, again, the feet would be cubic feet moved by the movers. Large would be number of large boxes moved by the movers. Elevator would be yes or no. And that's my dummy variable. Again, qualitative variables are the dummy variables. And that's how we work with them. We only have one dummy variable here. If you have another dummy variable, it'd also be a one or a zero. So my prediction equation, as you can see, is nothing more than 299 for the intercept, 0.026 for the feet slope, 504 for the large boxes slope, and elevator yes is a negative 677. So these, this is my prediction equation. So first, what does the feet slope mean? Well, what it means is that holding the effect of large, number of large boxes, and the, if you have an elevator yes or no, constant, then for each cubic extra feet of material added, cubic feet of product added, the average increasing time to move is increased by 0.026 hours. So you see the effect of cubic feet per hour right here, or hour per cubic feet right here. Holding number of large boxes and elevator constant. The more interesting one is right here, the elevator slope. What does it actually mean to be a negative 677? First of all, does it make sense that the slope is actually negative? Well, if you think about it, it should. We're talking about the total number of hours it needs to move the packages, move everything. And a negative makes sense because if you have an elevator, it should make your life easier to move the packages, especially if it's on the second floor or third floor. That's one thing that's not in this information was whether the packages were on the first or second floor or where they were. That would probably be a variable that'd be very, very useful here. So the elevator slope, what does it mean? Well, again, it means holding the other variables constant, in this case, feet in large. Then if we have an elevator, the average move time is decreased by 6.77 hours. And of course, with a prediction equation, you can try to make a prediction. What you would need is how many cubic feet you want to move, 500? Okay, 500 goes in. How many large boxes do you have? You have 10 large boxes, plug in 10. Do you have an elevator? No? That's a good question. What do you put in there? 
you can't put the letter with the word no in there. If you put the word no in there, your prediction will be a number minus 6.77 times no. That's not useful. Well, that's why you got to understand how to make a dummy variable work. And in this case, the dummy variable no represents zero. And so you'd put a zero here. You would not get the benefit of an elevator. And so you would not get to shave 6.77 hours typically off on your work. And so again, if we plug 500 into feet, 10 into large, add a 2.99 for the constant, we would get a total amount of labor hours needed to move this type of material. Excellent. By the way, over here, you can see, going back to my previous video on multiple regression, a couple things. First of all, you have the F test. Recall what the F test is and what it means. Well, the p-value, again, is really close to zero. And so we do have evidence that at least one of our variables is related to labor hours. But of course, which ones are both significant? That's why you would do the t-test for each variable. And what you have here is the t-value, the t-test, and the probability, the p-values for each of the t-test. I like to see that each one of these is triple star which means each one of these is statistically significant, and it really doesn't matter on what alpha you give, whether the alpha is one, five, or 10%, you will reject each one, which means there's evidence that each variable contributes to the regression model. So not only do we have a significant, all variables are related to the labor hours and accommodation, but each one is specific and is needed for the regression model. That's awesome information to know. Extra piece of information is the adjusted R squared right here. The adjusted R squared is 9579. Wow, that's large. And what does it mean? Well, it means that 95% of the variation in labor hours is based on the variables we've chosen. That means we have definitely chosen a beautiful set of variables. Of course, the adjusted R squared I like because we adjust for the sample size and we adjust for the number of variables. Remember, if you pick a lot of variables, adjusted R squared is going to go up huge, but adjusted R squared adjust for that. In the end, what I like to look at is the difference between the regular R squared, multiple R squared, which goes up based on anyways the number of variables, and the adjusted R squared, which is adjusted by the number of variables. There should always be a decrease because if you're adjusting by the number of variables, there should be a, a decrease. I look to see if the decrease is that substantial. In this case, there isn't, which makes me believe I have a parsimonious set of variables, a really sweet set of variables, and that's awesome. Now that we've talked about the dummy variables and the variables feet and large, the next thing you gotta do is, of course, the residual analysis. And so, first thing, right off the bat, we're going to plot the residual analysis of our model, which would be move one. The first plot is the overall linearity equal variance check. And if I look left to right, the scatter's not that bad as you look left to right. There are some potential points of interest, and that's why they're numbered 21, 30, and 36. Maybe we have a Cook's distance issue. May, that is an outlier. We'll check that out. Next plot is the normal QQ plot, our normality plot. So we have the, L and e, the linearity equal variance from the previous plot. Now we have the n for normality in this plot. And I, as I look at the values, once again, looks like we have three culprits where we're departing a little bit. And actually, maybe we're departing too much for normality. But overall, I think you're pretty close hugging this data. So I'm pretty happy for normality. Over here, just a different type of scale location. Not so worried about this plot. This is the plot I'm looking at. This is my quick Cook's distance plot. Once again, as a reminder, these are the cutoffs, as we call them for Cook's distance. If a dot gets outside of these dotted lines, and by the way, if you don't see dotted lines in your picture, that means you're not far, your data is not too far away. That means you don't have any influential points, leverage points, outlier points. We happen to have one here, 0.36. There clearly is a potential influential point, and that should be investigated further in what you want to do. Typical thing to do would be to take that point out, redo the analysis, and then compare and contrast. I'll leave that to the reader to do. So we have plotted the overall linear map. 
So now, what, usually when you have many, many variables, you should look at the plot of each one of these variables against the residuals to see if there's anything that comes out from one of the variables. So what our models called move one, and we pull off the residuals as such, and we plot that. The idea would be, is feet, we know overall the model's good, but do, are any of the individual variables potentially causing an issue with the linearity and the equal variance? So let's check it out. Well, as you look at the feet versus the residuals, I see complete randomness as I look left to right. That is great. And so that tells me feet is really a nice variable in this case. Let's plot again, not feet, but let's look at large. Number of large boxes. All right, well, this one's a little bit more stratified because there's only one, two, three, four, five, six, four boxes. But still, as I look left to right, the spread isn't really changed much. Maybe it's shrinking, or could that just be the lack of sizes, lack of number of boxes for this? Maybe there's a shrinkage, maybe there's an equal variance issue, maybe a transform could help out in my prediction. But overall, as I look left to right, besides my potential outlier, not too many big issues. Now, where it comes fun is when we look at the elevator variable because that is a qualitative variable. In plotting the qualitative variable, notice what happened. Instead of getting a typical residual plot, you got a residual plot that is more of box plots. And that makes sense when you only have two variables to work with, the zeros and the ones, the no's and the yeses. So what are you looking for here? You're looking for a pretty symmetric box plot. Um, and I'm kind of, this is okay, I'm kind of worried about the yeses. They're kind of pulled one direction. This tail is longer. It's not really symmetric. So maybe we have some issues in the residuals there. Maybe. Maybe when we get rid of the outliers for um, the number of boxes, that might tend to go away. Um, so I am worried about this one variable and its influence on the matter. But overall, it's not too bad. So now that we've checked the residuals, which means overall, I'm okay with the model. Of course, we would always try to improve this model for future reference. If we like this model, could we improve on it? So what you see here is just my quick summary. You know, first plot of the plot feature looks at linearity and equal variance, and the spread looks random. Second plot is, uh, yeah, the second plot is for normality, and we might have an outlier at the point I said. The fourth plot is definitely for Cook's and outliers, and we definitely have a point we should investigate later, that point 36. I should say, just a reminder, the second plot is for normality, and there wasn't much departure in the dots away from that line, so we had normality. So overall, I had L, E, and N of line. Over here, I individualized, checked out each one of the X variables versus the residuals. The feet and large looked pretty good. The elevator, eh, we want the spread to be roughly symmetric. Uh, you could give a case that it is roughly symmetric in the case of yes, but I would like to, again, look at dumping that one outlier and see if that enhances these plots and my fears, my sort of fears, go away. Excellent. By the way, there are many, many dummy variables. I often use dummy variables for quarters. That's an interesting one. Think about that for quarters. You have four quarters, all right, um, when you're dealing with data collected over quarters. That dummy variable, you're actually going to need three dummy vari variables for that. And I'll let you think about that. Why would you need three dummy variables for, you know, if you're, you're looking at quarters and you have four of them, why only need three dummy variables. I'm pausing, giving you a chance to think about that. The answer is pretty simple. If you have three zeros, then by default, 
that means you that means you are on the fourth quarter. Hence, you'd be plugging in one for, you know, if your variables are Q1, Q2, Q3, you know, if you wanted quarter one, you'd go one, zero, zero. If you wanted quarter two, you'd go zero, one, zero. If you wanted quarter three, you'd go zero, zero, one. And if you want quarter four, you'd go zero, zero, zero. And that's how you could dummy something that has more options than just yes or no or north or south or east or west if you have something that has many many qualitative options like gender or ethnicity you'll just have to do n minus one for categories for dummy for that i hope that has helped you understand a little bit about dummy variables okay let's move on Oh, by the way, I, before I move on, I did run the independence test because obviously you have L, N, and E I've just talked about significantly. I haven't talked about independence. To do independence, you, of course, would do the Durbin-Watson test on your model. And in this case, we get a p-value that's large. Well, the good news is a p-value large is actually what we want, all right? A large p-value is what you want, and that means we actually do not reject, which means we don't have autocorrelation. Uh, we, we are really a nice independent set. So the independence is verified here. You truly have to understand each test to know when is it okay to reject, when is it not okay to reject. In this case, rejecting, or sorry, not rejecting is a good thing. Please note, right? The p-value is large, and so we do not reject h not and of course if you have no clue what h not is you don't know what you're rejecting in this case h not you you assume independence in a derman watson test you assume independence you have to show out of correlation so what we have here is we do not reject h not which means we we have no auto correlation awesome by the way at any time you should pause this video take a look at my notes Take a look at the executive sample like I've written here for house market value. See another um, dummy variable and what it means at work. I'm going to move on to our lecture on interaction terms. What is an interaction term and how does one work with that in our studio? Well, an interaction term is when you think the effects of one variable interacts with another variable the explanatory variables, and you want to signal that out. You want to kind of fix that out. So, for example, let's say you're studying the effects of a diet drink and the diet pill on weight loss. The main effect would be the effect of the diet drink on weight loss and the effect of the diet pill on weight loss. Those are two things you're looking at, the diet drink on weight loss and the diet pill on weight loss. The problem is there could be an interaction effect that could be speeding up the weight loss or even slowing it down. So this is very important when people are looking at the synergy in medicine and how two drugs could work together to cause a greater effect or a lesser effect. Let's look at this type of thing called the interaction effect. So how do we do it? Well, for example, do we think there potentially could be, we'll call it, uh, what I call it, move one, so we'll call it move two now, do you think that there could be an effect of when we move for hours, we have our feet, we have our large, and we have our elevator. Do you think there's an interaction effect between elevator and large number of boxes? How do we figure that out? Well, the interaction effect is the multiplication symbol. That's actually directly not true, but I'll explain that as we go on further in this video. So there's move two, and of course move two does not exist. As you see, I made a boo-boo there, put an arrow. Now move two exists, and I can run a summary on move two. Let's check out the interaction effect. And so what we have here is this right there. The interactive effect is clearly significant 
and it is under 1%. So to me, that is significant for all um, alpha values that I care about. My p-value is very small. And so what I see is there's clearly an interaction between a number of large boxes in my moving company I would have to move and whether we used and whether um, we have the elevator to use or not. It, this has this interaction here has an, is a variable that is significant. I do notice when I have this variable, I notice that elevator yes became not as significant. And so the question would be, should we keep that variable in? That is, should we keep that variable? Notice we now have four variables, feet, large, elevator, yes or no, and the interaction effect variable. Notice three of these uh, four variables are significant. One isn't. One would naturally wonder, should I get rid of this variable and what does it mean? So that is something later to discuss in model fitting. Right now, I'm just looking at the interaction variable. Notice the symbol used in our studio, the colon. If I wanted to be specific and not just do the times, I could do the colon, which is actually the specific way of just bringing in the interaction variable only. What am I talking about? I'll explain it again as we do these examples. So there's move to adjusted to include the interaction variable. Summary of that. And with my screen, you'll notice as you look up and down in both of the summary, there's not much of a change. And there isn't. There is not much of a difference between here to here. So what does that mean? Well, this is specifically adding the interaction variable. This is also adding the interaction variable, the time symbol, but it's doing more. What do you mean? Well, one last little thing. Let's, we're doing the, inter, the interaction between large and elevator. Let's kill elevator and large and rerun the summary. And look what we get again. And in fact, I did something wrong and I realized that. All I did was feet and large and elevator interaction variable. I didn't do what I wanted to do, which was uh, feet and large elevator with the multiplication sign. What I'm trying to show you is what the multiplication sign is doing. When you run it with the multiplication sign, it is giving you the previous numbers, the negative 183, the old two. What's going on when you do the multiplication sign? Is the multiplication sign runs the large, that is the x1 variable, runs the elevator yes variable, and then runs the interaction variable. If you just want the interaction variable, it would just be a colon. Doing the multiplication sign does include the interaction variable, but also includes the large and elevator by default, in case you're wondering what it actually does and the difference between the interaction variable and the actual interaction variable and the multiplication sign, which is the interaction variable and the individual variables also added to the prediction equation, the linear model. In either case, we see here, right here, that large and elevated yes clearly have a significant interaction, and that interaction should be explored in how that can improve or not improve your prediction status. How, you, how would you do that? You would now go through the residual analysis, as I did earlier, just for these new set of variables. Excellent. Let's just check my notes. Play it around with it, play it around with it, play it around with it. And that's just my final note on the interaction. So in this example, we clearly have an interaction. What do we do with it? Well, the first thing I would do is probably remove the elevator, yes. So in my case, I would look at feet, large, but I would restrict to just those three variables. Notice I switched to the colon. Those three gets rid of the elevator, yes. Notice you got rid of the elevator, yes. And so you have, to me, a more significant prediction equation because S statistic tells me I have a great linear combination and 
all the variables contribute. Up here, this variable did not contribute. To me, model fitting, my next video, will tell you that I would eliminate variables that are not contributing. And so then I have all three contributing and these are their slopes. And so now I can investigate the prediction line and see what each slope represents, how it affects the labor hours. I thank you guys for watching this video on dummy variables and interaction variables. And I look forward to you watching other videos of mine.